next speaker is Bim Hugo from the National Research Foundation South Africa, South African Earth Observation Network. Uh, he's also a member of the World Data System Scientific Committee and he will talk to us about multidisciplinary framework for bioenergy assessment. The floor is yours, Bim. Thanks, Mustafa. Um, I tend to agree with Bob to some extent. I'm an engineer and not a scientist. And uh, I have for many years worked in decision support systems in industry, commercial industry. And we need to take decisions at given time, given <coughs> times, without uh, the benefit of perfect data. Um, and that is common in business and becoming more common, I guess, in the realm of politics and policy formulation. So, with that in mind, we started building a framework to say we have to take some decisions now. Scientists want the data to be as perfect as possible, but we don't have that much. So we started off by looking at the interoperability requirements of such a framework to support <coughs> the decision making about bioenergy applications in South Africa. And of course, spread broadly over these uh, three, three categories of syntactic uh, interoperability, semantic and semantic. Of course, the semantic side, especially things like and so on, is by far and away the most difficult part to achieve because these are technical issues where it needs a knowledge. But nevertheless, I think we've made some progress. <coughs> On the semantic side, we decided to introduce the idea of a, a common analysis unit, which is a, a vector and not a raster, a medium level uh, planning area. And it has some benefits in the sense that it is uh, homogeneous in respect of administrative boundaries, settlement typology, conservation status, and a few other uh, things. Uh, so this has been used then to gather data across a wide variety of disciplines, not only to do with environmental science. So we have things like uh, demography, demand, and economic indicators, importantly, copious information on processing options for bioenergy and their cost implications, their job creation potentials, their greenhouse gas impacts, and so on and so forth. And then, uh, important, a whole bunch of assumptions. Because one of the problems with decision making by just looking at science is that everybody is producing information and data about these <coughs> things, but they all use a different set of assumptions. And to weed out and compare the, the results that you get from published papers is a huge task. So we started out by saying we're going to standardize the assumptions about things like population growth and inflation rates and cost of capital and all the things that feed into the modeling so that we have a um, I'm not going to talk too much about the methodology except to say that we've gone through a process where a lot of the data that we found in the literature about bioenergy talks about yields and potentials, but that's not so important as figuring out what the feasibility of the application is because there are costs involved, there are impacts involved, and many of these potentials cannot, for practical and economic reasons, be translated into a feasible source of data. The framework that we provided gives us a, a web-based uh, infrastructure that starts with data, spatial data sets, and other kinds of data uh, reports dealing with a whole number of themes, so synthesis reports that are study preparation and a number of case studies. And then we have applications. We have an interactive web-based atlas, interactive decision support that I'll talk about a little bit uh, shortly, and then a search facility. So. <laughs> Important to realize that we have copious metadata for all of our data sets, that there's an integrated search facility, and as we'll see right at the end, the platform extends into other systems and remains that have nothing to do or little to do with bioenergy uh, per se, but feeds into the data sets that we have for uh, socioeconomic aspect, demography, economic. Okay, so typical uh, examples of the kind of data that you can find there, theoretical yields for a whole lot of uh, crops, uh, things like the potential and availability of biomass across a whole range of sources, whether it's waste products, 
agricultural residue, forestry residue, uh, purposely cultivated crops. So we've surveyed uh, as, as wide as possible, widely as possible in terms of the availability of biomass. We then also assess the availability of infrastructure across uh, different categories. So we have detailed information on point and network infrastructure, so things like pipelines and rail, and where agricultural silos are present and what their sizes are, where the processing plants are for electricity generation from a variety of sources and so on. Thinking that the good places to establish bioenergy facilities would be in close proximity or adjacent to existing infrastructure with some obvious savings. So we've assessed the infrastructure to start with on the basis of a few indicators, like whether it is to what extent currently poorly served population in terms of energy, largely rural poor, that are using firewood most of the time for the energy need. Now they relate to infrastructure availability, and the red areas, of course, are areas where there is a large rural population that poorly served by current infrastructure. The same in terms of economic activity. Quite unsurprisingly, the infrastructure is following where the economic activity is, so there's very few areas where uh, there's a discrepancy. And then in terms of biomass availability, it means that these areas where we have the red uh, shading are areas where there is uh, not a good supply of infrastructure, but there is a good supply of biomass. We also evaluate the processing technologies, as I indicated. So for all different uh, set or for a number of different categories of energy generation from lignocellulose, cellulose, uh, vegetable oils, organic waste, starches and sugar, we have evaluated across 52 process technologies the most optimal ones over the long term in terms of capital and operating costs. Together with the transport costs of supplying that across the different ranges of or catchment areas where the biomass needs to be captured. So we have these indicators, so don't worry about the legend, it's probably a little bit brief, as a few other things are at the moment. But um, these are indications of the most appropriate technologies for a specific biomass feedstock across different ranges of capacity. So we know that if there is a large availability of biomass, that technology will be more cost effective than this one, which is more cost effective at small scale. Okay, so to put that into perspective, for different kinds of technology and biomass combinations, we have ranges of affordability. So in areas where we have the biggest concentration of biomass, the cost is low. And as the availability and the scale decreases, the costs go up. So we have a way of deciding that, no, it doesn't make sense to go beyond maybe implementation of, in this case, about 40 megawatts or so, when it comes to feedstock uh, A. Of our given so we've done all of the feasibility assessment for combinations of feedstocks and 52 process technologies. And then we get maps like this that look at the optimal allocation of a biomass to a certain processing technology. And I don't know if you can see it that well, but there's an example where initially the costs are high with a darker shading of green. But as I increase the size of my catchment area, the economy of scale reduces the total cost of production until such time when the transport costs start pushing the costs up again. And uh, after that, we then uh, halt the production of, uh, at that specific site. So we are able to provide district and local level decision support. We have implemented an indicator viewing environment that's got spatial and other filters available to it and can produce output in maps, charts, tables, all those kinds of presentations so that local and district and provincial authorities can look at all of the feasible options for their region kind of questions that we could answer, what are the most feasible options and their impacts, talking a little bit about that. Very important in our context, what, how do we assist the rural poor? We face a situation in South Africa where we are already burning biomass for energy inefficiently in the rural areas. 
So transport or transforming those populations to coal-based electricity will actually push us back, even though it has a beneficial social can we supplement electricity generation? The answer is yes, but only about 1,400 megawatts. The best options for lingocellulose biomass and cellular questions could be answered. The benefits of the framework, obviously, that uh, our interoperability is now sim uh, simplified. We have cross-disciplinary uh, analysis of filtering of options. And we have access to data sets produced by third parties. Last slide, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But we are in desperate need of a common vocabulary, maybe definition of essential variables in this domain, and a global framework, I think, is still not practical. So, in terms of infrastructure and sustainability, we are fortunate that we have funding in a shared uh, knowledge management platform of which the bioenergy atlas makes use. And in this, we have a whole series of uh, automated harvesters that go and fetch metadata from any number of data providers. So our analysis and our indicators, in theory, can be bought from standards-compatible data sources wherever they are. It doesn't have to be hosted by us. And then we have, uh, uh, let's say, integration so that collaborators and users can find the data. And in the near future, execute models with what if analysis onto that same platform, linking to GIOS, so on and so on. Okay, that's the long and the short of my story. Thank you very much, uh, Bim. Uh, if you have one factual question, we can take it. Otherwise, we'll move to the next speaker. We have one question here from Sandy. So, Bim, you talked about impacts, but I'm not quite clear what you do. Yes, so we've evaluated things like job creation, greenhouse gas reduction, if any, um, contribution to regional GBA, uh, saving time in an aggregate way because rural populations spend an inordinate amount of their time capital on gathering stuff for energy. Uh, so there's a range of these social economic and uh, biodiversity impacts that we assess for, for each of the feasibility assessments. And, and you could build new ones, I'm thinking some of the biofuels, for example, with these BBOCs, which is going yes. to be an issue. Yes. So if we have data for the processing technology and a feedstock combination, then we can add that into the mix. Thank you, Vic.